Good morning, everyone. Okay, now this is the nine o'clock session, so I'm gonna need a little bit more than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I want to start off with a huge congratulations because the fact that I'm looking at your face means that you have made the two-mile walk to Hall E and you didn't get lost, which is more than I can say for myself. Thank God I was early. Welcome to our very important session on shutting down the school to prison pipeline. I will be your moderator for this session. My name is Cami Anderson and I most recently was the superintendent of Newark Public Schools and before that, the superintendent of Alternative High Schools, um, which um, encompassed a wide range of services for young people on Rikers Island, in juvenile justice centers, second chance high schools, kids who were struggling with addiction, kids who had kids, and a, a variety of other pieces. So this issue is near and dear to my heart. So as I was thinking about how to open today's session, I had a lot of fancy slides. I didn't make them, not very good at that. I need help if someone wants to tutor me. Um, but I actually thought I would start with a bit of a personal story instead, just to frame the conversation. So sometime circa 2008, I had the pleasure of being called for jury duty in New York City. Raise your hand if you've done jury duty before. So I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but it is an experience. I know it sounds weird, but I was kind of excited. Doing your civic duty is important, right? And turning off your cell phone and your email's awesome too. So for the better part of two days, I sat quietly with perfect strangers saying virtually nothing and reading my latest spy novel. Yes, I am that person. Instead of catching up on Jim Collins or Ed Week, I was there reading John Grissom. Around day th three, my group, along with, with what must have been several other groups, were called into a different room. We were sort of ushered into this huge room, much like this, and it felt enormous, cavernous, and there were probably 500 people there, and it looked like a courtroom. There was a table for the defendants, there was a table for the prosecution, there were lawyers, and this was surprising to me. I felt like I had no idea this was part of a process. For those of you who are lawyers and are in courtrooms, this might seem pro forma, but I was a little stressed out. So this is a process called voir dire, which someone can tell me the actual um, meaning later, but I think it means see truth or, or something like that in in French, excellent, so glad, should have Googled that. Note to self, <laughs> embarrassing if I was wrong. Um, so what happens is they ask you a series of questions that get increasingly personal in front of like God in the world and people that you'll never see again, which is ostensibly to determine through this weird questioning process whether or not you're biased or qualified to serve on the jury. Where do you work? How long have you worked there? Do you know anyone in law enforcement? Do you like them? What did you eat for breakfast? Seriously, someone asked me that. I couldn't remember. I found the entire process bizarre and felt pretty exposed because it felt like overdisclosure. Well, after the lawyers finished their questioning, the judge turned on his microphone, all of his robes and his seriousness, and he started asking another series of questions. He cleared his throat and said, raise your hand if you have a family member who has been convicted of a crime. Keep it up if it was a felony. Keep it up if it was someone you're close with. Keep it up if that person has spent significant time in jail or prison. Now everyone with your hands up, get in a line in front of me, he said it just like this, so I can ask you some more questions about your experience in the criminal justice system. I remember being so stunned that it took me a second to put my hand down. It was kind of hurting from leaving it up that long as I made my way to the line. So I stood in line and I was kind of near the back because it took me so long to figure out what we were supposed to do. And immediately I noticed that I was one of, one of, if not the only white person in that line. Now, growing up in a multiracial family, this did not shock me, but it did make me mad and it always does. So it took me a while to have my turn in front of the judge. So I had a lot of time wondering what is he gonna ask me? And as I was there, I spent the entire time fighting back tears of anger and pain and sadness thinking about my brother, Philip. So Philip was born addicted to heroin, which I, we didn't know too late in his life because of a broken child welfare system that is prone to secrecy and judgment instead of openness. To this day, addiction drives a lot of his bad decisions. He was moved from foster home to foster home and was deemed psychopathic before he was five. And all these years that I've run dysfunctional systems, it still shocks me that like some adult actually put that on paper. 
incredible. I thought about all the times he was called out for bad behavior that I undoubtedly would have gotten a pass on until at some point his behavior did become that bad. I remembered, despite his extraordinary intellect, the IEPs and the segregated placements that he ran away from because he felt like he didn't belong there. I thought about the misdemeanor arrests becoming more and more severe and, incredibly, and his incredibly thoughtful and self-aware letters he wrote me from jail describing in very specific terms how he was learning to become a hardened criminal on the inside. I also remember all the things he stole from me and my other siblings usually to buy drugs, but how I loved and missed him all the same. I was snapped out of my musing by the judge in the robes who made me put my hand on the Bible to swear to tell the truth, the whole thing, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Miss Anderson, I see. Miss Anderson, I see. He looms large in my memory. I don't, he might have been short. I have no idea. Um, and I detected a note of surprise in his voice that I was in this line. Who in your family put you here? My brother, Your Honor. Where is he now? On the streets. He was recently paroled. Do you have contact with him? Yes. And so the questions went and went until he asked me one I wasn't expecting. Do you think your brother's punishment was fair? Whoa. I was quiet, kind of taken off guard for the 15th time in 10 minutes. Somehow the presence of the Bible, the whole God tell the truth thing, and my trip down memory lane made me say something I didn't mean to or expect to say. Well, yes and no, Your Honor, I said. What? Yes and no? What exactly do you mean by that? Well, Your Honor, my brother's made a lot of bad decisions and he has hurt a lot of people. So he should be responsible for his actions, but he's black. And I don't think it's exactly a secret, just check out the line here, that the system treats poor people of color, especially black men, fairly. Needless to say, I didn't get selected, <laughs> which, by the way, was honestly not my goal. I kind of liked my John Grissom novel. But I left it with a renewed commitment to advocating for justice. Uh, I share that story to open this session not because I want you to think my brother is perfect or blameless, he's not. Not because I want you to think my family is novel or perfect, we're not. By the way, shout out to my sister-in-law in the second row, she'll tell you plenty of things to set you straight. Um, rather, I share that story because this work is quite personal for me, like I know it is to many of you. In my professional life, I have also seen the schooled prison pipeline in action all too frequently. I could give you so many examples and so many statistics but I will highlight only a few for your consideration. 70% of the inmates in California were connected to the foster care system at one point in their lives. Out of school time caused by punitive discipline is often a bigger predictor of who is going to drop out than any other school-based factor, and in some studies, even more than teacher quality and school quality. Being black or brown and male and getting suspended makes the pro probability that you will do time a virtual statistical certainty. Almost all kids who drop out have been suspended, and young adults who don't have a high school diploma are three times more likely to be unemployed and two times more likely to be incarcerated. This is what we call the school the prison pipeline. Folks, here is the inconvenient truth. Education, including education reform, is part of the problem. And we have not made a dent in this cycle. For all of the great things we have done as a movement, and I'm proud to be part of this, we have not made a dent in this problem. And in some cases, we've made it worse. Some kids, too often, those we think of as other people's children, are caught in a wheel of multiple systems that fail them and make success damn near impossible. Why is this the first time Teach for America has had this topic on the agenda, even though several of us have been advocating for years? I'm usually very calm on the heels of these types of sessions and really look forward to giving remarks, especially about what I'm passionate about, but I lost sleep over this one. Why was everyone so surprised that this session filled up? Why has the school reform community been largely silent about the undeniable presence of the school to prison pipeline and in some instance, instances exacerbated it by defending indefensible practices like zero tolerance, like biased discipline, like kicking out or quietly pushing out the most difficult kids and school models that are culturally incompetent that we haven't examined. 
I am part of the old guard. There's gray hair here. It's just, you know, not being a natural blonde has its, you know, benefits. But I'm part, of, I'm part of the old guard. How did I let us, how did we let us get here? And how can we do better in the second wave of our work? I know these are hard questions. This is so uncomfortable. But I believe in the power of this network to ask themselves tough questions, learn lessons, and apply them to our work so that our movement can truly embrace its founding principles of equity and excellence and apply them to all kids. Looking at our lineup of speakers, I'm hopeful they will give us some insights, some models, some questions, some data, some inspiration about how to think about all this. And I couldn't be more grateful to be your moderator at what feels like a critical moment in our time for us to step up and shut down the school to prison pipeline. That's the end of my remarks. You can clap if you want. Michelle Norris, Nancy Hakes, uh, Hanks, Claire Blumenson, and John King, what a lineup. We, so without further ado, I want to hear from them, and we will speak, and Amy, Ro I don't know why you didn't make it on here, right? Amy, Rosa, she'll make it up here, don't worry. Um, I would like to um, first bring up to the stage someone who probably needs no introduction. Many of us know and have admired her for years. Um, her name is Michelle Norris. She's a leading voice on race and justice in our country a well-known journalist and speaker, and a personal inspiration to a lot of folks in this room. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Michelle Norris, and I'm going to try to flip through all these slides that are not supposed to be here while we're doing it. Hold on one second. Oh, awkward moment. I didn't do this, y'all. So, and now we're out of order. Bear with me. Technical. There we go. We're moving. We're not moving. Oh, God. Okay. So, we're not going to have a picture of Michelle on the thing, but you'll see her lovely face live in two seconds, Michelle. Good morning, y'all. Since I work in radio, it's sort of appropriate that you don't see my face, right? <laughs> Since you usually just hear my voice. Um, Cami, thank you for opening this session with uh, such beautiful words and such honesty and let us feel the spirit of Philip and so many others like him in this room as we begin this discussion. Good morning. Good morning. Let us all um, dwell in power this morning. I am from Minnesota. <laughs> but my father was from Birmingham, Alabama. So I spent a childhood shuttling between these two states. I had winters in Minnesota and summers in Birmingham. So my childhood could pretty much be described as extreme weather. But I want to share with you an impression that has always stayed with me from my time in Birmingham. My parents lived in Ensley. Alabama in the shadow of the steel mills. I still remember as a kid sitting on the porch and the sky would glow orange when the furnaces would be burning at night. And engine was the, education, excuse me, was the engine of upward mobility. Such that when we traveled around Birmingham, every time we saw a teacher, my grandfather, who was this magnificently large man who always wore big black suits, and it was of a time where people wore hats. You remember that? You didn't leave the house unless you had a hat on. And whenever we would travel through Birmingham, if we were downtown or if we were in the Ensley Business District or we were at Bruno's, which was the big grocery store, if he saw a teacher, he would immediately doff his hat. He would immediately take his hat off and step aside so the teacher could move forward. Teachers were held in such high regard in that community, and I have never lost sight of that. So I doff my hat to all of you because I understand the power that you hold in shaping young minds and shaping a larger society. I want you to think of an image, if you can, as we continue to have this conversation. What would you do if you were approaching an intersection and you saw a child about to enter that intersection and you could see something that the child couldn't see. You could see a big Mack truck coming toward that intersection. What would you do 
to keep that child out of harm's way. I ask you to think about that image because for so many young people who are in school today, something is coming for them. Something is coming for them that will take them potentially out of society and place them on a parallel track where they are removed from general society and in some people's view, comfortably removed from general society. Cami shared with us some statistics. As a journalist, I reach for statistics sometimes to help me understand things. So I'm gonna share a few with you this morning also. And with our esteemed panel, I assume that all of you have these numbers, but these numbers all represent young people. I almost went to the basement this morning where I keep a bag of my kids' shoes. My kids are teenagers now, but I, I still have a bag with all their shoes. And I almost thought about putting a pair right here so you would understand what we're talking about. Young people. In America right now, there are 1.2 million children who have a parent in prison. That's about one in nine kids. And we know that when that parent is in prison, that that child is more likely to perform poorly in school. That child is more likely to have all kinds of um, difficulties in trying to adjust to society while their parent is away. We know that the rate of incarceration has seen a five-fold increase. Historically, it's been about 100 people per 100,000 people in America. It rose to 500 per 100,000 people, and we didn't think it could continue to go up, and now it's on its way to 700 per 100,000 people. We're no longer locking up individuals. We as a nation are locking up whole societies. We know that black men and brown men with low levels of education have a 70% chance of going to prison. Can I just repeat that for a minute? 70% chance of going to prison. And that means that prison, for so many people, becomes a normal life event, a milestone, a natural tributary for countless communities, a tether to so many families, an unfortunate beacon that seems like it is inevitable. Why does this happen? It happens because of policy. It happens because of the persistence in a community. Prison, for many of us, seems like the thing that you would want to avoid. And yet for so many people, prison is not, they know so many people in prison. They visit prisons regularly to see friends and family members. It's not this scary, spooky thing. It is a part of their everyday existence. And it also happens because of a pernicious mindset that we've allowed to settle in as a society. I'm a journalist, but I engage in a, a sort of strange exercise that I've been running for the last five years called the Race Card Project, where I ask people to send their stories about race and identity to me in short sentences six word sentences. I created this five years ago to help cultivate a conversation around race and now I have tens of thousands of submissions and many of them come from teachers. Many of them come from teachers who are trying to figure out how to bridge a gulf in their classroom because there is a, a, a gulf in the classroom because of class or because of color or because they're in a community that they don't well understand. And the six word exercise helps them understand um, their students, helps their students understand them, helps them find a way to each other. And I just want to share with you one of the stories that I received from a teacher because I appreciate the honesty that comes through in these stories and it speaks to the mindset and it speaks to the power that we have when we're able to look inside ourselves and study why we do certain things. Examine the implicit biases that we all have. A teacher sent in six words about incarceration. His father was in car sales, was her six words. His father was in car sales. Let me explain the story. She was working with a young man, and she was talking to him about his future. As it starts to happen in your junior year when they say they start to talk to you, well, are you going to go to college? Are you going to go to community college? Are you going to go to work? Let's talk about your future. And after that conversation, she went and spoke to another teacher. And she said, what can we do to help that young man? It must be so difficult for him because his father is in jail. And the other teacher said, what are you talking about? And teacher number one said, well, I was talking to him and, and he mentioned something about his father and it made me realize that life must be so difficult for him. And teacher number two said, excuse me, his father works at a Volvo dealership. Are you with me? He had said that his father was in car sales, but the teacher had processed that to mean that his father was incarcerated. 
And she sent in those six words because she said, I had to check myself. Why did my mind immediately go there with that student? If I was talking to someone else whose name was Seth instead of Hakeem, would my mind have gone to that place? Why did I immediately so easily assume that his father was on a path to incarceration instead of sitting behind a desk trying to sell Volvos to people? I honored that story and I share it with you because what that teacher did is talk about it, is share that, examine it. Where did that attitude come from? What can I do to change that? And that is why, where I leave you with this. You're in Washington, D.C., a city filled with people who are allegedly powerful. There are monuments to people who are powerful. There are people, if you spend any time here, people will, within the first two sentences, tell you what you do and give you a business card to let you know how powerful they are. I challenge that because I actually think that the people who are gathered here in this magnificent hall today are the most powerful people in Washington because you will have your hands on the shoulders of young people. You will shape not just their lives, but broader society. The statistics that you will hear today, the stories that you've heard, the speakers that you will hear from, they will all fill your, your, your heart and fill your mind with wisdom. But understand also that when you think about this and you think about what led us to this moment, there were a series of decisions made by people who were honorable. They thought they were doing the right thing. So what decisions will you make? How honest will you be with yourselves about your fears and, yes, your biases? About taking the easy path instead of the courageous path? Think about that as you think about your futures and understand, truly understand, that you are the most powerful people in Washington. Walk in power, live in courage, and dwell in beauty. Thank you very, very much. Don't you love that picture up there? It's beautiful. Um, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, who's a 2004 Atlanta alum, born and raised in the west side of Chicago. I wanted to make sure I got that right. And um, a former principal and now a systems leader who's going to talk to us about her experiences in the work. So please welcome to the stage, Nancy. Morning. When Vicki asked me to do this, I was like, oh, it's going to be an ad talk. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to have my mic on. And then she told me it was going to be like 1,500 people. I was like, you don't let me all at that podium, no. <laughs> I think I'm going to need that. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I thought really long and hard about um, what I had to say to you about a subject like the school to prison pipeline. I found myself wondering what I had to say that was so compelling or profound that it would leave you inspired to act and convicted. And I thought maybe like what quotes could I share, you know, should I go with like an MLK quote or more like a Gandhi, be the change, you know, the usual suspects. But that didn't seem like the word that I wanted to share with you on this morning. So I went back to the drawing board. In my next draft I decided Maybe I should just point to the data, right? Because the data should be enough to move them. Stats shared by the US Department of Education like the fact that while black students represent only 16% of the student population, they constitute 32 to 42% of students suspended or expelled, and 27% of students referred to law enforcement. And then I thought if I really wanted to piss them off, I can share stories about judges literally selling kids to privately run jails and detention centers and making close to $2.6 million in the process. But then I started to think about this a different way. But see, a part of the problem is when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, some of us are looking for someone to blame, a group, a system, an antagonist or a villain, if you will. We've somehow found a way 
to conveniently externalize the pipeline. We've made it about systems and structures and vestiges, and we've divorced it from the actions that each of us take every day. We've made it this abstract thing, you know, something out there, something to be shunned and examined, a Huffington Post article to share, another cause to tweet. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not asleep or naive or dismissing any of the complexities of institutional racism or mass incarceration or the myriad of forces at work here. But when we do that, when we keep the conversation at that level and we only focus on it that way, it allows us to avoid doing the one thing that none of us want to do, which is make it personal and admit our own fault and contributions to the pipeline. And I know that's hard to hear, but yes, you and I, intelligent, well-intentioned warriors of equity, we contribute to the pipeline. Consider this. If you're a teacher, it's in the moments when the unconscious bias that we all have compels you to address the aggressive or off-task behaviors of your scholars of color, while the identical behaviors of their white peers often go unaddressed banishing those students to the main office, discipline referral form in hand while you continue on with your common core aligned lesson. That's your contribution. If you're a dean or a principal or assistant principal, it's in the powerful decision points that you hold as to whether or not you're going to suspend or expel students sometimes as young as four and five years old because they've somehow disrupted the learning environment or violated one of the often subjective infractions in our codes of conduct. And it's also in the incidents when we deliberately misuse school resource officers, inappropriately involving them in incidents that often don't need officer involvement and escalate in a matter of seconds, blurring the line of what is criminal behavior and simply matters of school discipline. That's your contribution. And if you're a superintendent or a CEO or you run a CMO, then it's in the policies that you fail to change. Continuing to promote zero tolerance, masking it as just a commitment to safety or high and unwavering scholarly-like expectations. Failing to engage your boards and the conversation around the data and the disproportionality because they may think that a more restorative approach will be too soft. And after all, rocking that boat might cost you your next contract. That's your contribution. And I can go on and on, but you get the point. Yes, systems matter. And yes, there are villains out there. But we got to be way more honest and own our piece of this. Now, I can see somebody walking out of here feeling some type of way, saying, you hear her? She up there talking about I'm contributing to the pipeline. I am a drum major for justice. But I promise. <laughs> I promise you, it's, it's all in love. It's all in love, and I don't have all the answers. I just tried to learn from my mistakes. Just this past Christmas Eve, I ran into one of the only students that I ever referred to for an expulsion when I was a principal on the west side of Chicago. I was on an elevator, headed to Denham, scrolling through my Instagram timeline. The bell rang, the door is open, and I heard a raspy with warm voice say, Hello, Miss Hanks. My eyes lifted from the screen, and I saw this tall and familiar frame standing before me. I remember the incident quite clearly. He brought a BB gun to school, a very realistic-looking BB gun. And I was livid at the time. I wasn't angry because I thought he wanted to hurt somebody. I actually didn't believe that he did. I was angry because I had busted my behind for two years at that point to turn that school around and establish community, and to repair the climate, and to make kids feel safe. Him bringing that BB gun wasn't just a threat to safety, it was a threat to me and my reputation that I was building for myself and for the school, and nobody was going to compromise that. At the time, I couldn't separate the child from the act. I couldn't find that powerful just mercy that Brian Stevenson so passionately writes about. So I went to my code of conduct, and I referred him for an expulsion. I greeted him with the, hey, sweetie, how are you? It was all I could manage to get out at the time. 
My heart was pounding, and at that moment, I could feel the full weight of my decision rushing at me all at once. Is he still in school? Has he been in trouble with the law? Did I toss this child into the pipeline? My mind was racing, and at the time, I felt like I couldn't breathe. I'm cool, I'm cool, he replied. You know, I'm at Phoenix, the military academy. My grades, I mean, they're pretty good. I'm getting ready to take the ACT. I was actually going to come out and see if I can get some help with that. I was selfishly relieved that despite my lack of compassion and understanding and patience and mercy, that he seemed to be thriving and that by the grace of God, he hadn't wound up in the juvenile, in the juvenile justice system. We chatted for a few minutes. I fished a business card out of my bag. I gave him a hug and I told him to call me so I could make sure that he was well prepared for the ACT. Okay, cool. Merry Christmas, Miss Hanks, were his parting words and we both went our separate ways. I cried as soon as I got in the car and all the way to dinner. I prayed for forgiveness for that time and any other time that I betrayed the privilege given to me to be a steward and protect her over children I serve. For any time I never just let kids be kids, goofy, carefree kids that make mistakes, sometimes big, sometimes small. And for holding kids to standards, I don't even hold myself too, quite honestly. I tried to pull it together, and I can hear my grandmother's voice say, brand new mercies, baby, brand new mercies. We all get brand new mercy each day. So today, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the grace that someone extended that young man when I couldn't muster it up myself. I'm grateful that I got a chance to get it right in my current role as the chief of schools in Madison, Wisconsin. In 2014, under the leadership of my superintendent, we passed a new policy that departed significantly from the district's past code of conduct, which was based on zero tolerance. It was a courageous and conscious choice that included the elimination of suspension in grades pre-K through third grade and a drastic reduction, thank you, in the number of infractions that could lead to suspension and expulsion in grades four through 12. In our first year of implementation, we saw that suspensions decreased by more than 40% across the district, which restored 1,900 days of what would have been lost instruction. 1,200 of which were for African-American students. Each day, our team continues to refine both the policy and the implementation of the plan. And there's still more work to be done, but that's my contribution. When you know better, do better. Thankfully, that applies to all of us, and we all have access to those new mercies, a chance each day to walk out of here, to do over, to try it another way, and to own our own power to dismantle the pipeline. Thank you. All right, very powerful. Thank you for, for that. Um, next, we have a 2006 New York City. Whoop, whoop. Where are my New York people? Come on. Um, New York uh, alum. Um, later on, we have someone who has a nine, a nine in front of their core year. Thank God. Um, she happens to have, right? Woot, woot for 90s, early 90s and out there. All right. Um, she happens to have, uh, be a little bit stressed about talking in front of John King, who was her principal's boss, apparently, when she was a teacher. So she's, she wants to make sure that John closes his ears for a few parts of this uh, talk of hers. Um, and after she was a teacher, um, went on to get her law degree and has been a special education lawyer for kids 18 to 24 who are connected to the juvenile justice system as an advocate. And she'll tell you more about her work there. So please welcome Claire. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, it's really, really great to be here, and I'm glad to hear that this is an issue that keeps other people up at night. Um, it certainly gives me the pit, um, and that's a feeling that I think I first started to get when I was teaching. Um, it's sort of that feeling where you know you've done something, um, and, and you feel like there's, there's something that you need to apologize for. Um, I first started feeling that way uh, probably my, within the first month of teaching, and then I started to feel that way all the time. Um, I think fourth grade picture day was probably one of the biggest learning experiences that I've had. Um, I did the new teacher thing where I constantly reminded my students to fill out the forms that I put in their homework, their homework folders. And I said, don't forget, if you don't fill out your form and return it, you won't get a picture. And so my fourth grade students, they all filled out their forms and they put them in their homework folders. And one of them even came up to me and said, my mom wants me to double check with you that you got my form and that I'm all set for picture day. She sends it to, to all of our, my relatives. So I said, if it was in the folder, then I definitely turned it in because I'm your teacher and I'm responsible. And you don't need to worry about that. Worry about being a student. And sure enough, I don't know why I said that, but I did. And on picture day, I found that same student crying at the end of the day. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, I didn't have a form turned in. I, I said, oh my, there's no way I could have, this could have been my fault, right? And I looked over and I saw the sloppy homework bin that I had where I stuffed all the kids' papers and all of a sudden I saw his yellow slip of paper right in between goldfish and multiplication tables and I realized I completely just forgot to turn it in. His mother came in and said to me, do you understand the responsibility of what you're doing? Like, do, do you know what it is like to actually be responsible for another human being and for other people's children? And do you have a process? Do you, have, do you think about it? Do you value this? Because it doesn't seem like you do because of the sloppy way that this all happened. I, had, I got the pit really bad. And that feeling is something that the school to prison pipeline, it gives me the pit really bad. And once everyone gets the pit at the same time, that's sort of when we start to see things happen and start to see things move. And I remember when I first learned about the school to prison pipeline, I, I thought of it as only sort of that fourth grade, you know, experience that I was having where you had, you know, the first kid who was getting into the juvenile system for his very first time, his first arrest. And that's how we talk about the school to prison pipeline all the time. We don't talk about those kids who are already in the system. We take a prevention approach and we've been successful, but we fail all the time. And if we only continue to take this prevention approach and we don't expand our conversation around the school to prison pipeline, we're gonna miss so many students. I'm not saying that everyone here should have the pit right now, but I guess in some ways I really am. We, we can't continue to have the same conversation over and over, but only look at that kid who had his first brush with the system and is getting suspended and expelled from school. We have to look at my clients, for example, who are 18 to 22 year olds who have been incarcerated. They're at the deep end of the prison pipeline. But it's not too late for them. And if we truly believe that all students have a chance to succeed and we want to see them do that, then we have to recognize that it's really not too late. So if we expand our conversation, then why would we include these students? Well, for one, they suffer the biggest hardships of any students. My clients, for example, they go through things like going to residential facilities across the country and coming home after four years of being rehabilitated to find out that their credits never counted. Iowa and DC, they, they just don't have the same standards. My client said, are you kidding me? I just spent four years in residential facilities that the government placed me in. And you're telling me I'm not a senior, I'm a freshman at age 21? This kind of thing blows my mind. 
And for students who have been in the school to prison pipeline, they've lived this forever. For them, they just don't know what else to do. And so they want to give up. But they're not going to. They're turning to us. And we have this, this option now, a responsibility. So one of the problems is that these students, they, they're at the whim of all of different agencies. So we have the education agencies. We have justice agencies. And nobody seems to be talking. For example, when one student gets sent to a facility, he finds that his records don't translate. So nobody knows he has special education needs at all. For another student, he took Algebra 2 three times. I, that, this is a ridiculous thing that's easy to fix. But the other thing is, if we identify it, we're going to be able to fix it. The problem is, if we don't see these students as part of the pipeline, we'll never be able to fix it. The first step is really identifying and including them in the conversation. So what does that look like for us? Well, first of all, we need to understand that we have to have programs for students who are already in the school to prison pipeline, who are already incarcerated. We have to have programs that are for 18 to 22 year olds. We have federal law that says they're entitled to education at age 20, 21. And yet, we don't have schools for them when they come home from facilities. I mean, none of that makes sense. And so what happens? Well, they come home and they're forced to go to school with younger kids. Can you imagine being 21 years old and going to school with ninth graders who are 14? The reason I can imagine it is because I've watched that happen to five of my clients. That was the only option that the city had. This kind of thing is appalling. And yet, if we're not including them in the conversation, we're never gonna change it. People don't know that there are 18 to 22 year olds all over the country who are sent to facilities and they're languishing there. For a lot of them, their IEPs never went with them. They haven't been evaluated in years. But until we include them in the conversation about what we're trying to change, we'll still focus on prevention and early intervention. And that leaves out this entire critical group of students. So aside from the fact that they're hidden, right, because they're older, they're not who we usually think of when we think of students, and they're definitely not who we think of when we think of the juvenile system, because they're 18, 19, 20. Why else, I mean, why else can't we find these students? Why didn't we know? Why didn't I know when I started to become a lawyer? Why didn't I know that I would see all of these students when I worked inside the facility for the past four years? Well, I didn't know because there's a data gap, right? So if you're in the education data industry, you're rarely counting students who are incarcerated. If you're in the juvenile justice agency, you're not counting students who are 18, 19, 20, 21. Even if they're in your facilities, they're still not juvenile. If you're in the criminal justice system, you're not counting special education. So you have this group, this small group of students, but it's not that small, who seem to fall through this fissure where they're not in, they don't show up in any of the data, they are out in facilities, they don't have an advocacy movement around them to say, wait, focus on us, don't just focus on the 14, 15 year old. They end up just being just languishing. And this does something to your identity, and it does something to the connection that you have with your community. My clients say, well, if there are no programs, Claire, then does that mean that people have forgotten about us? And the answer seems to be yes. And they say, well, if the advocates aren't mad about this like they were mad about the younger kids, do we not matter? Is it too late for us? And that's a hard question for me to answer because honestly, if we do truly want to end the school to prison pipeline, we have to move past just prevention and early intervention and we need to be looking at the whole pipeline that includes these students. So 
I think we do care. I, th I certainly think this room cares. Um, and I think that the most important thing we can do is just expand our conversation, build the language, stop saying things like, you know, get school or prison, and stop saying things like before it's too late. It's not too late. And I think we're the group of people who can, who can do this by telling one person. If everyone in here told one person, oh, weird thing, I heard that there are a lot of 20-year-olds who are in juvenile facilities across the country, and there are some really bad situations going on, that's another huge group of people who's gonna know about this. And we can only start to change things once we know, once we've accepted that the school to prison pipeline isn't just about expansion, uh, expulsions and suspensions, right? My kids can't get expelled or suspended because they can't get back into school. And so what I'm asking for you to do today is just think about how you frame the issue and try to go out of your way to add in the students who are at the deep end of the pipeline. Talk about them. Let your friends know that there are 20-year-olds who only have the option of sitting in a classroom with 14-year-olds or signing out of special education. Tell your students, because your students are actually the ones who are gonna be able to really change a lot. And once we all get that feeling, that pit, like, oh, there are these students we're not talking about, that's when we're actually gonna see some movement. So I guess if we can all do that, I think we're gonna be in a much better place because I've seen the strides we've made on the prevention side. And I have faith that if anyone can do this, it's a group of people who are eager to do it. So when you leave here, please commit to informing people about the students who are at the deep end of the system and making sure that they're part of the movement. Thank you. Just reviewing some things, we're just going over some things. <laughs> That's All me. Right. Give it up for Amy. <laughs> Thanks. Does this one work? It does. Great. So uh, it was important to me that you could, I, I, when I went over this with my students, I told them that you would see their, their eyes and faces, so I wanted to make sure that happened. Um, so this is Jermaine Isaac. Jermaine's fourth from the left in the first photo, and he's featured in the second photo. He's 26 years old now, but at 17, he woke up from a nightmare, pained. He dreamed that he had a daughter and that she asked him to read a picture book to her. And he couldn't do it because he knew that he was not able to read well enough to read a picture book. Waking up with a nightmare was a particular vulnerability for Jermaine because he was in prison. Arrested at 15, he was serving a decades-long sentence in adult prison. Thinking of the daughter that he dreamed of, Jermaine devised a plan. First, he started trading with older guys for old newspapers. He'd take the papers, he'd lock in his cell early so he'd just get this little bit of time alone, and he'd sound out whatever he could make out from the newspaper, and he would read it over and over and over again out loud. And he continued this for a while. And when he felt confident enough in his reading to go back to school, he started attending the prison's adult basic ed classes. And he worked so hard, and he got his GED. 
and then he was transferred to one of the only facilities in the United States that has college classes for incarcerated people, and he enrolled immediately. Jermaine is now in his second year as a Goucher College student. This semester, he's taking environmental studies and Spanish 110. In addition to attending college, he works earning about a dollar a day within the prison. And on top of that, he looks for young men who remind him of himself at an earlier age, and he tutors them and he reteaches what he's learning in the classes. This is Ramika Fowler. Ramika began her studies with Goucher College through the Goucher Prison Education Partnership in 2012. She took three college prep classes and then went on to earn 28 college credits before her release from prison last summer. In the last six months, she's gotten a job, gotten a raise at that job, and begun tutoring for a high school student. In her free time, she participates in advocacy work for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, and she's saving for a return to college, which she hopes to make happen next fall. Ramika lists US history and statistics among her favorite college classes. Here's what Ramika told my colleague Nancy about statistics. When I was in grade school, I wasn't the best at math. I resisted and fought math for so long. With my Goucher professors encouraging me, I learned to conquer math. It was the first battle in my life that I conquered and won. Ramika is a first-generation college student. Since she began college, her daughter graduated from high school and also enrolled in college. Right? Yes. Give it up for Ramika and her daughter. <laughs> um, and they're now actually in this battle to see which of them is going to walk across the stage and get their diploma first. So I'm Amy Rosa. I'm the director of the Goucher Prison Education Partnership, GPEP. Since working as a teacher and also a program director with Teach for America, I've collaborated on educational opportunity at Rikers Island Jail in New York City, San Quentin State Prison in California, and now with Goucher College and the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services in Baltimore and Jessup, Maryland. The Goucher Prison Education Partnership is a division of Goucher College that gives men and women incarcerated in state prison the opportunity to pursue an excellent college education. So it is college just inside prisons. At GPEP, we offer a rigorous education. So it's college credit classes taught on site by Goucher professors, and we do it at no cost to the students. We also offer college preparatory classes to help students who are not ready for college get ready. And we offer academic tutoring and office hours with professors and advisors. We currently raise 100% of the needed financial support for this work from private grants and individual donations. Many of our students live below the poverty line before coming to prison. 70%, 70% were parents of children under 21 at the time of arrest. And 70% of GPEP students are first generation college students. A number of our students actually earned their GED or GED in prison, and they were the first in their families to get a high school diploma or GED. Last summer, the US Departments of Education and Justice chose GPEP as the site to announce the Second Chance Pell Grant pilot, which will allow incarcerated people access to federal funding to help cover the cost of undergraduate education. Incarcerated people have been excluded from access to Pell Grants since the 1990s. So the only college that has been available has been through some form of private funding. And today there are only a handful, a few dozen maybe, colleges serving the 2.2 million incarcerated people in the United States. There's a growth, so we're, I think we're at this really exciting moment in criminal justice, in criminal justice reform. There seems to be real traction across the political spectrum. And the importance of education in prison is being acknowledged at the highest levels. There's a growing understanding that education in prison is fiscally responsible, that we do not need to choose between supporting victims and educating people in prison, that ending intergenerational cycles of poverty and incarceration and low educational attainment benefits all of us. But in some of these conversations, there's a way of talking about college and education in prison that I want all of us to reflect on together today. This way of thinking about college and prison defines the purpose of 
of college as reducing recidivism. By that definition, the measure of a college education becomes whether it stops people from going back to prison. Let me be clear, reducing recidivism is hugely important, and if you can help someone stay out of prison or keep them from going back to prison, you change their life. However, I want to suggest to you, and the Teach for America community will understand me here, I want to suggest to you that we hold the educations of our most vulnerable students, our incarcerated students, overwhelmingly from under-resourced communities, that we hold the educations of these most vulnerable students to our highest standards. That reducing recidivism is one goal, but, and I would actually argue one of the less ambitious goals, but just one goal of education in prison. As is clear to everyone in this room, education in our home communities is not simply about keeping children out of prison. Similarly, education in prison is not simply to reduce recidivism. There is consistent data on recidivism in education. A recent RAND Corporation meta-analysis tells us that access to education in prison typically means a 43% reduction in the likelihood of returning to prison. And the higher the education, the lower the recidivism rate. But when we make education in prison just about recidivism, we engage in what the Reverend Vivian Nixon of the College and Community Fellowship in New York City, what she describes as a collective failure of imagination. She asks, how can our highest vision for our most marginalized students be a paycheck to paycheck job and not getting back to prison within 12 months of release? A job that puts food on the table is a big deal, but it cannot be our greatest goal for our students. Our students have much greater goals for themselves. When I ask my students, our Goucher students at the prisons, why they spend so much time and energy and effort on college, they, and this shouldn't surprise, they answer as scholars and students. Yes, they want good jobs and they want a good income and which college students don't. But when they talk about college, they talk about connection to a larger world. They talk about investment in self. They talk about the experience of having professors and an institution of higher learning recognize in them someone worth investing in. They talk about the importance of historical and political and scientific context for lived experience. They talk about a sense of belonging to communities, academic and other, that they were unaware existed before their study. One of our students recently, when casually asked what he was getting out of college, described in great detail with contagious excitement Frederick Douglass's critiques of arguments supporting slavery based in the Constitution. He saves his class readings, he gives them to his family, insists that they read them, and then holds discussions about them on phone calls and on visits. Another student describes the power that she feels knowing statistics and calculus, the confidence, sense of accomplishment, and affirmation of being able to turn to any page in a college calculus textbook and do that problem set, but also the new ways of seeing the world that come with that kind of mathematical knowledge. As Jody Lewin of the Prison University Project has said, college and prison can feel like returning stolen property to its rightful owner. So let us set our sights here. Does the education ignite the mind? Does it prepare students for a life of personal, political, social, and yes, professional engagement? Does it hold each student to the highest expectations? Does it communicate the greatness of that student's potential and promise? Does it provide the tools for the student to invest in that potential? If the answers to that, those questions is yes, the education cannot help but reduce the likelihood that students go back to prison because it offers them the opportunity to engage deeply in the world, to contribute fully to the world. The opportunity for a lifetime of questioning, of belonging, of choice, for a full and robust life. And isn't that what we want for all of our students? I'm so happy to be in this conversation with all of you, and I look forward to continuing it uh, with you and the other panelists. Thank you.
gosh, this slide thing is like looming at me. John, I have to try to find your picture. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Seriously? Come on, man. So close and yet so far. So that is not a picture of John King, in case you were wondering. So close and yet so far. Someone's going to give me some tutoring after this. My bad. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure, Vicki Wolf. OK. Um, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our esteemed Secretary of Education. But I thought I would do it by telling you three things you might not know about John King. Don't get nervous. I won't say anything bad. Um, one is that John has spoken increasingly and eloquently in lots of places that you can see on YouTube and things he tweets because he's much more technologically savvy than me. But he's spoken quite a bit about his own journey and his own background and the resilience that he's displayed as a person and a leader throughout his life um, that I think would really resonate with this crowd and certainly is an inspiration to a lot of us. Uh, the second thing you might uh, not know is that in some education circles we think of him as the stealth assassin, but that's kind of uh, Bellacosta language, I get accused of that a lot. So instead we have tr translated it to the graceful revolutionary. I like stealth assassin, but you know, some people get stressed out when we talk like that. Um, and, and third, John is, is one of the kindest people, although he did turn down the Newark job, so I still, you know, blame him for, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I was privileged to um, have that role, but he did, uh, him saying no is what led them to offer me as the very uh, far below second choice. Um, but he is, um, he is my friend and he is a, a kind person, um, and having him at the highest levels of our government um, gives me tremendous comfort and tremendous pride um, and frankly tremendous hope that we will make progress on issues like this that have been silent for too long. So without any further ado, the Secretary of Education, John King. Good morning. That was a little low energy. I know from emails I got from some folks in this room that folks were out a little late <laughs> last night. So I'm going to say good morning again and expect a more enthusiastic response. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Um, thank you, Cami, for that introduction. Cami has been a friend for a very long time. And I, there are many things I deeply admire about Cami. Um, two of them is her steadfast resolve in, in the face of whatever opposition may come. And the other is that she models for all of us seeing in every child potential and hope. And she sees her family, her siblings, and every child she meets, no matter their circumstance, no matter their challenges, and is committed to their success. And I, I just deeply admire that. So thank you for your leadership, Cami. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you, and it's an honor to follow a group of panelists whose work I deeply admire, from uh, spending time with Amy at, at the announcement of the Second Chance Pell to uh, watching Claire as in her first day of teaching. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to follow such thoughtful uh, folks who are so committed to this work. I want to take the conversation in a bit of a different direction, and I want to challenge us with the fundamental question of what would it take to stop the school to prison pipeline? What is the set of policy actions that it would take to transform our country in this way? And in order to do that, I think we have to look at the school to prison pipeline not in isolation, but as embedded in challenges we face as a country and delivering on the promise of equality of opportunity. And when I sit at home and struggle as a parent with how I'm going to explain Tamir Rice or Laquan McDonald to my nine-year-old and my 12-year-old, that's not separate from the school to prison pipeline. It is interconnected with the school to prison pipeline. When I see that the unemployment rate for African-American men in New Orleans is over 50 percent, that's not separate from the school to prison pipeline. It's interconnected with the school to prison pipeline. So the question for us is, if we as a country are going to fulfill the promise of equality, what would it take to end the school to prison pipeline, to change the conversation, to deliver on the promise that is embedded in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? 
And so I want to suggest that there are three areas of work where we must focus our attention, and I want to call us to action. Because sometimes those who care deeply about social justice, sometimes we are guilty of spending more time admiring the problem than solving the problem. And so what I know about folks in this room who made the decision to pursue teaching, made the decision to be a part of the Teach for America community, you are about action. That's why you're in this room. And so I want to call us to action on three things where I think we can make a dramatic difference moving forward as a country and end the school to prison pipeline. The first is we need a public education system that every child deserves. We need schools that public education, public schools that every child can go to that reflect what each of us would want for our own children. And that, be, and that, is, a, that is a large public policy demand, but we can't think of the school to prison pipeline as an isolated policy issue. We've got to ask, what would it take for all kids to be on a path to success in college careers and life? And that is a high quality public education. Education is the right response to our challenges as a country. And so we begin with every child needs to be able to have access to high quality preschool. Those of us who have been in kindergarten classrooms where the kids hold the book upside down because they're that unfamiliar with reading and letters because they've been read to so rarely, we know that the achievement gap starts early. All the evidence suggests that students who have access to high quality preschool are more likely to be successful in school. They are more likely to graduate from high school. They are more likely, it's even strong evidence that those who attend high quality preschool are more likely to be healthy as adults. And so, but as a country, we are failing to invest adequately in preschool. In too many communities, there are three and four year olds who do not have access to quality preschool. And so we've got to change that reality, and that is within our grasp. That is a matter of political organizing. It is a matter of demanding of our leaders exactly what they would provide for their own children. High quality preschool for all kids. It means that we need schools that not only are committed to equipping kids with core academic skills, but are places that inspire joy in learning. Schools that not only provide skills in English and math, but, but ensure that students are getting science and social studies and art and music and the opportunity to develop socio-emotional skills. Schools that, that build our young people up. That is part of how we challenge the school to prison pipeline. We need schools that respond to the challenges kids face outside of school. Too often in education policy debates today, we are stuck in an empty, false dichotomy. Folks who would claim that school's all that matters and what happens outside of school is irrelevant. Or folks who will equally falsely claim that school doesn't matter at all and we can't fix anything through education until we fix poverty. Both are wrong. The reality is that schools can be transformative in kids' lives and schools are embedded in communities and so we have to respond to the needs that students bring with them to school. We need schools, particularly those schools that are serving our highest needs students, need robust wraparound services. A child who is hungry is going to struggle to learn. A child who is homeless is going to struggle to learn. A child who's moving from place to place is going to struggle to learn. And we've got to respond to those challenges with supports. I know that school done right can be the difference in kids' lives because it was for me. As Cammie mentioned, I, I, I grew up in New York City. I went to elementary school in Brooklyn. No response to Brooklyn? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I went to elementary school in Brooklyn, in Canarsie, Brooklyn at PS 276. In October of my fourth grade year, my mom passed away. I lived with my dad who was struggling with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. And uh, home was this unpredictable place day to day. I didn't know what my father was going to be like. I didn't know what home was going to be like. But school was an amazing place where I was inspired and challenged and where I had a series of teachers who made school safe and structured and nurturing in a way that home was not. We read the New York Times every day. I always say my, my teacher who I had in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Mr. Osterwell, he was doing college and career ready standards before they were called college and career ready standards. We read the New York Times every day, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We did productions of Midsummer Night's Dream and Alice in Wonderland. He made school this place that was academically rigorous, 
but also emotionally supportive. If not for Mr. Osterwald, if not for the teachers I had at PS276, I wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't be standing here today. I may, have, I may have ended up in prison, but I may have ended up dead if not for the teachers who made a difference in my life. So we can't, we can't talk about the school to prison pipeline just as an abstract policy question. It is about how do we create schools that invest in our young people so that they are on a path to opportunity. Teachers could have looked at me and said, here's an African-American, Latino male student going to school in, in New York City in a public school with a family in crisis. What chance does he have? Too many of us have experienced conversations with colleagues that bring that mindset. What chance does he have? But they didn't do that. They invested in me. They saw potential in me. And they supported me. And they are the reason I'm here today. And they are the reason that I have such conviction that school can be the difference for our kids. So as we, as we think about how we end the school to prison pipeline, we must start with a high quality public school education for every child. Second, we have to remember that schools are, again, are embedded in communities. We need supportive systems and structures around schools, and we need, as professionals, to engage in the hard conversations around bias. What do I mean by structure? When you look at what is happening today in Detroit, and when you look at the way, as a country, we systematically underfund the schools that serve our neediest students, we are creating a structure that builds the school to prison pipeline. If we want to undo that structure, we have to provide the resources in all of our schools that we would demand for our own children. It shouldn't be that in some schools there, are, there is a computer for every child, and in other schools, the teacher walks into the cla classroom, into the computer lab, to find 16 computers, but they have 23 students, and they've got to figure out what to do. Right? It can't be that in some schools, kids have gym every day, and in other schools, the water leaks down from the roof, and the gym is closed for the year. Right? And so the structural challenge is around ensuring equity in school finance, but money is not alone is not enough. We know that high-quality teaching, and Teach for America is built on the notion that high-quality teaching can be the difference in classrooms. And so we've got to make sure that we have effective teachers in every classroom and that our teachers are well supported. It means that teachers need time for collaboration, they need meaningful feedback on their work, they need opportunities to work with peers to strengthen instruction. We need a teacher workforce that is prepared to work in diverse classrooms. Every teacher needs to be prepared to work with English learners. Every teacher needs to be prepared to work with students with disabilities. Every teacher needs to be prepared to work with students who struggle academically. And we need a diverse teacher workforce. We need a, a workforce that looks different than the workforce we have today. The majority of the students in our schools today in, in this country are students of color. But only 18% of our teachers are, are teachers of color, and only 2% of our teachers are African American male. We have to change that reality. That is a structure that contributes to the school to prison pipeline. If we do not have a teacher workforce that reflects the diversity we value, we will struggle to end the school to prison pipeline. So too is it a challenge to ending the school to prison pipeline that 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education, we have schools all over this country that are schools of concentrated poverty because of decisions adults have made. We don't have to be organized that way. And we could organize our schools as places that honor our diversity. We could make choices as communities to have schools that are socioeconomically and racially diverse. We could make choices to create school communities where diversity is a value to be celebrated. And so the structure that we have to challenge is a structure that separates. And we have to look for structures that bring us together. And we must, in every school and every community, have the hard conversations about issues of race and class and gender and, and LGBT issues. We've got to be communities that grapple with the challenges around our diversity and, and then move forward to support the learning of every child. And everybody in this room has to be the person who raises the uncomfortable conversation. And it is hard, and it is tiring, and it, there is a tax that comes with being the person to raise the uncomfortable conversation. But if you, if you walk through your school and only some kids are in the AP classes and other kids aren't, and you don't raise the uncomfortable conversation, 
you are part of the problem. If you walk through your school, if you walk into the robotics after school program, and there's only boys in the robotics after school program, and you don't say anything, you're part of the problem. And so the challenge is we all have to be the ones who, who, who take up the uncomfortable conversation. We all have to be the ones who raise our hands and say, you know, the folks in this room don't include anyone who looks like the children we serve. Why is that and what are we doing about that? And we have to do it not just in our schools and classrooms, but we got to do it in our boardrooms and in our executive offices. We've got to challenge those structures. So high quality public education for every child. Structures and systems that support the success of our children. And then to, to the points that, that you've heard today, we can't throw any child away. We've got to move to a system that is a prison to promise system. We've got to say when kids have made a mistake, they get a second chance. Now I often talk about the difference teachers made for me when I was in elementary school and middle school. And sometimes people think, you know, it's a simple narrative. You know, I lost my parents, I had struggles, teachers did good things for me, and it all ends so nicely. But I struggled in high school. I struggled with the rules. I got kicked out of school. I sometimes say to folks, I, I assume I am the first Secretary of Education to have been kicked out of school. But I, but, but I believe in second chances, and so I, I don't want to be the last. Right? Folks could have said, when I, when, when I was in high school, I resisted authority. I resisted adults. I felt like adults had let me down in a whole set of ways, and I was angry about experiences I'd had as a kid. And so I acted out. I made bad choices. And I got kicked out of school, and folks could have given up on me as we give up on so many of our young people, sadly, as a country, as a society. I made a mistake. I made a set of mistakes. Who among us hasn't made mistakes? But the question is, then what? And as a society, we have a responsibility not to throw folks away, but to build folks up, to say, you've made a mistake, but we're going to make sure you have a second chance. And so when we think about what happens to our young people in juvenile justice facilities, we've got to ask, what are we doing to make sure they have a second chance? You know, when you sit with young people in a juvenile justice facility, as I did a few months ago in Illinois, and you hear what kids have experienced, you hear the trauma they have experienced in their lives, you hear the abandonment they have experienced in their lives, and all they are looking for is hope, a reason to be hopeful. And I've talked to kids who say, I don't know what's going to happen when I leave here. I can't go back to my mom's house because of what happened with my mom. My school won't take me back. I don't know where I'm going to go. That's on us, the adults. Right? A 15-year-old shouldn't be left to figure out what's going to happen next. We have to invest in that 15-year-old. We have to create opportunity. So I challenge folks in this room who are looking for the next teaching challenge, teach in a juvenile justice facility. Like Amy, teach in, 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 a, in a program in prison. Maybe a college program, maybe just an adult literacy program in prison. Take the opportunity to bring your talent to, to young folks who need a second chance, who need someone to believe in them, who need someone to invest in them. We're committed to that at the department. It's why we are doing work all across the country to focus attention on the young people who are in juvenile justice facilities. It's why the president uh, allowed us to give access to Pell Grants to folks who are incarcerated so that they can pursue education and get a second chance. But we need more of that, and we need to remember it is about a systemic set of challenges. You know, we're going to have a, country, a conversation in this country over the next few weeks in Congress about criminal justice reform. Sadly, it is very likely that that conversation will focus almost exclusively on sentencing reform. We need sentencing reform. Many of the sentences that are given particularly for uh, nonviolent drug offenses make no sense. We need sentencing reform. But sentencing reform without systemic reform will be inadequate to the task. If we don't ensure that folks have access to education and job training in prison, and Amy made this point about the recidivism statistics, it is very clear. Job training and education programs 
lead folks to go back home and succeed. Succeed with their families, succeed for their kids, succeed for themselves and to contribute. In the absence of those, the sentences may be shorter, but folks will be right back if we don't create a path to opportunity. And so we've got to, in this conversation that we have as a country, we've got to talk about how we invest in meaningful second chances. And it means education and job programs. It also means changing a policy structure that denies folks who've been incarcerated access to housing. Right? A policy structure that denies folks who've been incarcerated access to jobs. And presidents led the way with, with an effort uh, around banning the box for federal employment. We have many employers around the country who are doing that, but we've got to do that much more quickly. We've got to make sure that when folks come back, they have an opportunity for success. And we've also got to make sure that what happens to them in prison, not only do we need to make sure they have access to education and job training, we've got to make sure they are not victims of abuse while in prison. Sentencing reform is important, but so too is prison reform. Prison should not be a place filled with violence and sexual assault. Prison should not be a place where folks are put in solitary confinement, where young people are put in solitary confinement for weeks or months on end. The president recently acted to ban solitary confinement for juveniles within the federal system. That should be a model, that's right, should be a model for the country. So I'll, I'll end with this. The question before us is, what role will we play? Those of us who are too young to have participated in the civil rights movement sometimes ask ourselves, where would we have been? What would we have done? Would we have gotten on, on, the, on the bus and gone down and tried to run a freedom school in the summer? Would we have been willing to sit at the lunch counter knowing how we would be abused? Would we have been willing to walk across the bridge knowing the violence to come? Would we have been willing to take risks and make personal sacrifices on behalf of the principles of equality and justice? And so we don't have to ask what we would have done, because we can ask ourselves the question, what will we do? What are we doing? What steps are we taking now? What are we doing today to ensure that we move towards a more just society? Yes, it is about confronting the ways each of us in our decisions contributes to the school-to-prison pipeline. It is about confronting the decisions that we make on a daily basis that contribute. It is about grappling with the challenge of how do we ensure that our school communities are places that are safe and secure for all students. It means we've got to struggle with the hard questions about how do we ensure that we don't just change policies, but we support people in their implementation. How do we make sure that teachers and principals have the training around positive behavior and intervention and supports, around restorative justice, so that we're not just saying, don't do exclusionary discipline. We're saying, don't do exclusionary discipline, and here's how you create safe and supportive communities for kids. We've got to do all of those things, but we've got to ask ourselves, what are we doing to change the systemic realities that are obstacles? Part of what gives me hope when I sit with my kids and I try to explain about Tamir Rice or about Laquan McDonald is I try to explain that I believe in the notion that the, uh, the long arc of history bends towards justice, that I believe that there are rooms like this gathered together where people are saying, what more can I do to make our society better? And so I, it's an honor to be with all of you because you chose to be in this room because you believe we can be better. And it's an honor to be in this room because I know you will go out from this conversation today striving to make our society better. Thank you. I have no more technology responsibilities, and my only responsibility is to try to um, leave us in about four minutes, so bear with me. And I'm going to leave you with the words of our panelists. What would it take to end the school-to-prison pipeline? Confronting implicit biases, owning power, know better, do better.
Know better, do better. What would it take to end the school to prison pipeline? Stop looking for someone to blame. Make it personal. Know better, do better. Know better, do better. What would it take to end the school to prison pipeline? Recovering stolen property and returning it to its rightful owner. Getting over our collective failure of imagination. Know better, do better. What would it take to end the school to prison pipeline? High quality education for all kids. Hard conversations about bias. Diversity as strength. Second chances. Removing systemic obstacles. What would it take to end the school and prison pipeline? Stop admiring the problem and start solving it. Make it personal. Courageously challenge your contributions. Know better, do better. Fill this ballroom at the 30th anniversary and celebrate our collective work in partnership with communities and other advocates across this country to end the school to prison pipeline. Enjoy the rest of your conference.